have our Bibles this morning, if you would, and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and while you're turning there, let's pray. Father, we ask right now, Lord God, that as we jump into this uh, epistle again, as we get back, Lord, to marching through Paul's letter to those wonderful, amazing thinkers, those Greeks, those Corinthians, Father, that we would remember uh, in a very profound way that you were speaking through your apostle to a church that you loved so dearly, but they had wandered far from you and what you wanted. And Lord, your commitment to them is undeniable. We've been seeing that every week. But Lord, I pray now in Jesus' name that you would cause us to leave this building today dramatically changed by the power of your word. We ask it now in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. We'll look there in chapter 3. We'll pick it up where we left off last time. We're looking at a message entitled, Jesus Christ and His New Home. Write that down, will you? Jesus Christ and His New Home. I am tempted to yell, stand on my head. I've had these thoughts of how can I get it across to the people about how serious I am this morning about this title and the message. And the Lord said, Jack, just calm down. That's my job. I'll speak to them. That's what I do. It's my people. I'll talk to them. You just give the word. You guys, this is incredible what Paul says to a church that's carnal, to a church that's messed up, to a church that's living goofy. Look what he says to them. And he says it to us this morning. Beginning at verse 16, Paul says to them, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temples you are. Let no one deceive you or be deceived himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, that's worldly wise, let him become a fool that he may become wise. That is, let him come to Christ and really get wise, which is the world's definition of foolishness. Verse 19, for the wisdom of God, or the wisdom, excuse me, of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness, that is the wisdom of the world. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. Therefore, let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. Listen to what he says to them. Whether Paul or Apollos, or Cephas, that's another name for Peter, or the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come, all are yours, and you are Christ, and Christ is God's. This is radical. Church, I don't know how far we'll get this morning. Hopefully, I'll get all the way through, but we'll go as far as we can today. It is over-the-top powerful. Listen, everybody, if we get this down in our lives, If we get this truth down in our lives, um, I will not be able, nor will you be able to define what God will be doing with us in short order. This is absolutely, truly radical, extravagant, over-the-top truth. So much so, look at verse 16. Paul says something profound. Do you not know? Uh, In Greek, there's a, a form of sarcasm. Uh, We would say, uh, don't you know this? If we were talking to somebody today, we'd say, come on. Or we would say, everybody knows this. What's wrong with you? We might even be justified in saying, have you forgotten the obvious? That's what he's saying to them. So the first thing I want you to look at in verses 16 to 17, Christian, is that your life, your very existence is God's home is the home of Jesus Christ. And we need to let that sink in. Honestly, just that truth alone. Need I even go any further? For us to meditate on the fact that in this, look, this carcass. In fact, as I pass through my own uh, air right here, I can smell my cologne. Why? Well, it's first service. Pray for third. It's a whole different smell. (laughs) I can smell my cologne. Why? Why? Because as I get older, I put more on. Why? As I get older, I stink. Death is coming upon me. Okay, but as a believer, that ain't all that bad news because I'm going to go see Jesus. 
But no matter what I do with my shirt, with my pants and my shoes or brushing my teeth, whatever it is on the external, will you agree with me that we put too much focus on the external and we often neglect the internal? And the the internal for the Christian is the fact that if you are a true Christian today, the Bible declares that you are a temple of God living for God and the spirit of God dwells within you. You can't get a greater radical truth than that in all of the world. That trumps everything that this world can offer. It trumps everything that the spiritual issues of the world can offer. This is God, the Holy Spirit, dwelling within his believers. And the thought of it, you guys, put yourself back 2,000 years ago. How radically dramatic and strange and really unorthodox that thinking was. When you go to a temple, a shrine, a church... A whatever. What are you expecting? Now, I've been to Russia more times than I can count. And the Russian Orthodox Church has bred it into the Russian Christian, the Russian Orthodox Christian, that they can't pray unless they're in the church. The moment that they go into the church, everything changes the moment they enter into the building. In fact, in Red Square, uh, when you go into uh, some of the churches that are there, uh, the former priest for a thousand years are in, ensconced, in, are entombed in the church for their sainthood, for their saintliness. The exact opposite is with us in God. When you come in here, you are not coming in here uh, to become uh, some sort of a, a saint and the moment you leave, you're not a saint. Oh, we want to pray. Let's get to church and pray. Hey, listen, if the church calls a prayer meeting, come and pray. But do you have to be at church to pray? Do you think God needs a temple? Did he need a temple in the wilderness, a tabernacle in the wilderness to dwell in? The Bible says no. Did he have to have a house in Jerusalem called the temple? He said no. He told David, can you build me a house for me to live in? Really? He said, I don't live in houses like you guys do. The heavens cannot contain him. But there's one thing that God has allowed himself, and this is so radical. There's one thing that he's allowed himself to dwell within and for him to declare, that's my temple is the individual believer that makes up the church. I don't mean the building. You here right now, if you're living, breathing right now, listening, and you're born again, Jesus said, John chapter 3, if you're saved by the power of God, you are a believer indwelt by the Holy Spirit, which makes you a temple of the living God. And then when we come together, that is also considered in Scripture the temple of the living God, not the building. And so, with that said, I want you to think about this. God not dwelling in physical structures because those things are not permanent. I love that idea. Is anything permanent in this physical world? No. So why would God waste his time? Buildings have their purpose. We are here. We will either be air-conditioned or heated. We will be seated. We will have lighting. We will have amplification. But that's it. All for this one reason, to get the word of God into you, the temple of God. So that when you leave, imagine, when you leave this building and go out into the world, this is what's so dramatic regarding this teaching. Corinthians, he would say, go out into Athens, go out into Corinth, go out into Greece and affect the world for Christ because wherever you're going, you are the temple of the living God. And if you and I really, listen, if you and I really believe that, how would we treat one another when we talk to one another, when we love on one another? Would we insult the temple of the living God? Would we abuse it? If a father understood that his children and his wife as believers are the temples of the living God, would he be abusive? Can you imagine coming against Christ himself? Or what about our own lives if we depart from this place and we've done our Christian thing in the morning, but we're going to go out and we're going to do drugs and live it up and do all this stuff that damages the body. Think about it. God says, hey, that's my body you're messing with right there. Did you know that? 
the human body. God says, I dwell in those who are my children. Now, just to be safe, God does not dwell. Let's make it clear. John Lennon was wrong. The Beatles didn't have it right. Okay, God does not dwell inside every human being. The moment a person comes to faith in Christ, 1 Corinthians 12 says, the Holy Spirit moves in. Now, when somebody says, well, we're, all, we're just all brothers and sisters in this whole wide world, that may be true uh, biologically, but it's not true spiritually. Ladies and gentlemen, the blood is thicker than water, then spirit's thicker than blood. Can you confess with me that our spiritual family, we have a closer relationship in our spiritual family than we do with our physical family? Man, I don't look to my physical family for nothing. I'm not talking about my wife and kids. I mean, I, I'm, I'm talking about outside that. But I know that if I picked up the phone or if you picked up the phone and you called one another, you'd have help right here, right now. That's awesome. Mark this down, verse 16. He's desiring a house for himself. You say, Jack, I thought you just said God didn't desire a place to live in. That's right, he doesn't. But when it comes to you, he desires a house for himself. And it's your life. Do you know Christ personally? What an awesome statement this is. Do you not know? Paul is challenging them that, number one, you are the temple of God, and number two, that the Spirit, notice in your Bible, it's a capital S, a reference to the Holy Spirit. Do you not know that the Holy Spirit of God dwells in you? The word dwells means that he has taken up a foundation, he's built it, and he, watch, he pulled a, he's got a chair, and he's sitting down in your life. How cool is that? God has taken a seat in your life as a believer. That's why you often hear me say, if you are a Christian, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And you'll see people go, yep, mm -hmm, that's right, yep. mm -hmm." And then you'll you'll see some people go, what are you talking about? Man, the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons and daughters of God. What a tremendous confidence that brings to us. It's a holy house, and it's a house that he desires for himself. There's two words, by the way, in the Greek for a temple, and the first one is a sacred place. It was the, um, an actual sacred location. Uh, it's it's uh, not permanent. It's temporary. And it would be, for example, the temple in Jerusalem. That word that means temporary was the word that was used for the temple in Jerusalem. And then there's another word, naosh in Greek, and it means the inner dwelling of the holy of holies. You see, but Jack, that was on earth, but wait a minute. It's the inner part of the temple, the holy of holies. It is the place where God dwells. Now watch this. When A priest entered the physical temple on earth. He came through a physical structure, but the whole point, the whole goal was to get past the physical. Are you listening? To get past the physical. That's a hint. The cologne, skin. (laughs) To get past the physical and get into the holy of holies, the naosh. Because where that is at, there's a time change. There is a new time zone. You go from, say, the time zone of Jerusalem as you walk up to the steps. You go under the Temple Mount proper. Then you go up the steps through the courtyard into the holy place and then into the Holy of Holies. God would allow his what's called Shekinah glory to dwell there between the cherubim. You've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark? Spielberg's got the two angels bowed over the mercy seat. Great representation, by the way. He did a great biblical job on that. Over that, God would allow his glory, not necessarily himself, because the Bible says no man can see God and live. Did you know that? Yikes. He would allow his glory to appear there. And in that moment, time stood still. It's another world. It's another universe. And that's where Jesus is inviting the Corinthian believer. And that's where he's inviting us. Christians, in this life, in this world, you and I are walking timepieces of eternity. 
The Holy Spirit dwells within us. You say, Jack, if that's true, then how come, how come like light doesn't come out of my eyeballs or out of my ears? You know, how come, why do I, when I stub my toe, why does it hurt? God in you does not necessarily affect in the sense that I won't get scratched. It doesn't mean that I won't feel pain. It doesn't mean that I won't die. It doesn't mean that I won't get cancer or that I won't fall down. It has nothing to do with that. The Bible says that we possess that truth in these earthen vessels. Is that not radical? Look at who you are in Jesus Christ. That's why I believe it is such a sin for the Christians to just sit around. How can we sit around at such a time like this? How can we sit around when the Holy Spirit is inside? Have you ever seen somebody in class that's the smarty pants? You know the guy that you always hated in school? Who every time the teacher said, does anybody know what the answer to that is? Where is he? Ooh, 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 ooh. Pick me, pick me. Call on me, call on me. And then the teacher eventually just says, oh, all right, Johnny. The Holy Spirit inside of you and I is saying, oh, 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 use me, use me. And we go, sit down. Sit down, I don't want to get involved. Sit down, I, I, might, may, I might make a mistake. Holy Spirit, sit down. I don't want to look like a goofball. We cut him off. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians, that's quenching the Holy Spirit. We don't want to quench the Holy Spirit. He's desiring to live within us, and he does. Listen to this, Acts chapter 7, verse 49. I'm going to give you a string of scriptures, so get ready. Acts 7, 49, God's eternal word, and this is amazing. All this truth will come to us most beneficial to the believer when we die. I announced to um, the guys yesterday at the conference, we're all going to die. got real quiet when I said that. Everyone's going to die. I don't know if they thought I had to open up my jacket and I had a vest on with bombs on it or something. I go, we're all going to die. Nobody likes to hear that reality, but it's true. But for the believer, what does that mean? Graduation. Yeah. See, I've never graduated, never completed my course. Well, if you're a Christian, you're going to complete the big one <laughs> and it's going to be good. Acts 7, 49 says, heaven is my throne, God says. The earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place for my rest or of my rest? And you can all take your finger and point right to the middle of your chest and say, my heart. How radical is that? Adam and Eve never, listen, met God in a temple, did they? See, well, they met him in a garden. That's right. They didn't meet him in a temple. Wherever Adam and Eve went, there God was. They interfaced with God face to face. You guys, I heard on the news this week, maybe you saw, there's been some special programs on it. Um, I don't mean to insult anybody, but I'm just basically quoting the program. They said America, and the world for that matter, except China. China is very committed to raising up really smart kids. And so they're going to be stepping in and lim limiting this. Um, but... They are concluding now that based upon current cultural uh, means of communication, that the United States will be the world's leading producers of idiots in the world. Idiots. Idiot. Why? Because the test that they said that children, kids are now texting to their friends some of them up to 3,000 texts a month. Some have texted 3,000 times in a week. Some have texted their family members from the room down the hallway in communication. What are you going to order? Hey, mom, like that uh, scrambled eggs, hash browns. What are you, what are you doing? Hey, dad, I'm, I'm going to be late to the... What, you, what is that? But here's the thing. Uh, mental, audible, motor, skill... Communication is producing idiots. We know the word idiot. An idiot is a person that has the inability to communicate what's in their head. How do you interview for a job? Uh, text, text the guy sitting across the table to you. I, and it's a crisis. 
You will never get a text from God. I, I was talking to someone this week, can't tell you who, and they said, we're on the brink. I cannot tell you. I cannot speak to you. I can't give you words. But when I send you a text that will be literally incoherent, it will, be, it will make no sense. It means that we're on our way. People are communicating in the world today. That makes no sense. And God is saying, listen, I not only want to talk to you. God says to the believer, I dwell in you. And it's funny because the world says, hey, if we could only get a, if we could only get a chip inside your head, we could actually communicate, rig it up to your brain. You could get a text. You could get conversation in your head. We could make an implant. Hey, God says, what are you doing that for? I'm already here. I love that kind of stuff. Astronomers look out into space and say, and they send messages, is there intelligent life? Of course, we think they must know English. <laughs> is anybody out there, out there, out there, out there, out there? God says, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. Could you imagine if NASA heard their ear? I could just see their earphones fly off their ears. God says, <laughs> Jesus says, hi, it's Jesus here. Come in, over. <laughs> Romans chapter 8, verse 10 says, And if Christ is in you, the body is dead. That is, my body's dead to sin. But the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give you, listen, give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. That is a guarantee that God says, When you drop dead... You wake up in heaven. And not only that, ultimately your body will be resurrected. You think you're living now? We're not even living yet, man. As a believer, we should be the most alive people on, plan on the planet. But man, our real life is coming. Gosh, think about it. Oh my goodness, he died. Oh, and you have a funeral and everyone's just, oh, what's the matter? He, my friend died. And you ask, right? We all ask this question. Was he a believer? Yes. <laughs> he was a believer. Okay, so you're crying because you miss him, right? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why. He just died, you know. Or he died young. Or they died as a child. Or they died old. Listen, listen. Death for us is an inconvenience. Both for those you know, who have got to plan for the death and those who have to attend the death. You got to take off work. You got to get an airplane. You got to fly. You got to go to the funeral. And it sounds kind of disrespectful what I'm talking about. But the Christian, don't think the Christian that died is dead. <laughs> Paul says, when we sorrow as believers, we're not to sorrow like those who have no hope. We can go like this. Oh man, yeah, <laughs> my dad died. I'm going to miss him. For a little bit. And then you turn right around and say, but man, if I just calm myself down and realize what he's looking at, and then you start reading Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5, and you look at what grandpa's looking at, you'll, you'll just go out and get a hamburger or something. <laughs> I mean, you'll be all pumped up. We're too fixed to this world. It's amazing. The Bible says in Acts 7, 47, but Solomon built him a house. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. Isn't that great? And so Paul in this declaration somewhat rebukes them. Here's another verse, 2 Corinthians 6, 16. 2 Corinthians 6, 16 says, And what agreement does the temple of God have with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. Has, listen, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Isn't that amazing? Listen, seriously. The Holy Spirit who dwells in a real believer will not allow a real believer to go get their palm read, for example. The Holy Spirit won't even allow it. He will so convict that Christian of that stupid thought because he'll say, hey, you belong to me, and that's demonism, and I will not allow this temple to be shared with idols. Did you know that? Horoscopes. Did you know where that horoscope, 
Have you ever heard the word zodiac? It's Babylonian. Hebrew is Maseroth. It's to discern your life through the reading of constellations and stars. Did you know God condemns the horoscope? You don't want to know why. It's not, he doesn't condemn it because it's fake. He condemns it because the source of it is real. It's real Satanism. And I've heard Christians say, I've had Christians ask me, oh, what, you know what? I want to ask you this question. What sign are you? And you know what my answer is every time? The cross. What sign are you? The cross. What? I mean, you know, are you a Taurus? Are you a whatever those names are? Bull? What's his name? The, the Taurus is the bull, right? So, no, I'm under the sign of the cross. Be careful. The Holy Spirit will not allow the temple of the living God, who you are, to intermingle with satanic issues. He won't do it. Oh, man, let's play Ouija board. Dude, let me tell you, stay, come with me for a week and visit people who, when we talk with them about their demonism and all the stuff that's going on in their satanic home, weird, freaky stuff going on, baby's crib, it's like a movie. Spielberg should come to work with me. You see a baby's crib bouncing on the floor, uh, bouncing on the, in the room, bouncing, with no baby in it. Bum, 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 bum. Hello! You don't mess as a Christian with seances and Ouija boards and that demonic stuff. God says, no, I will not have my people mix in that world. Why? Because he will not allow the temple that he dwells in to be with, as the Bible says, Belial, which is a word for Satan. I won't share you, he says, with somebody. Isn't that beautiful? That's the true definition, by the way, of the word from God, jealous. Don't think of human jealousy. That's nuts. God is jealous for you. He won't share you with some other God or gods that are invented by men. He loves you so dramatically, so radically, that when we leave this place in a moment, we are to understand, wow, look at me. I mean, I look like a normal guy. I look normal. Here I go. Norm I look normal. Nobody knows, though. Inside, the Holy Spirit of God dwells in me. I'm a child of the living God. And here I go. I'm going here. I'm going into Mimi's. I'm coming in. A Does it sound like I'm hungry? I keep bringing up food. I'm starving, man. <laughs> Sit down there. And they have no idea that sitting in that booth is a child of God, born again, the Spirit of God dwelling in you. That's why, you guys, pornography has no place in our lives. It's stupid. Don't go there. Or whatever it might be. Anything that brings you under the control of it is robbing the temple from God. Isn't it great? The scripture says that we've been bought with a price, therefore glorify God with our bodies. Isn't that cool? He owns you. And people go, I don't like that. I'm, I'm my own man. Oh, you think you are. <laughs> are you married? Yes, I'm my own man. Then you, you are, you're not your own man. <laughs> and then you go, oh, well, I'm my own man. I'm single. Dude, you are not owning yourself because the world snaps its fingers and you're instantly in a turmoil. But let me tell you something right now. Single or married? When you understand that the Holy Spirit dwells in you and he owns you, you don't have the right to tell him no. You don't have the right to ignore him. You and I, we're slaves to Christ, and it's the best thing that could ever happen. Jesus will lead and guide your life. I am so not going to make it through this message today. <laughs> but we need to hear this. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, the Bible says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? I can let you know on a secret if you don't already know it about yourself and me. We love, we love to be owned. So let me explain. There's nothing greater than for a child to have their parent come up and put their arm around them and just pull them in tight 
or, or little Miss America or Mr. America when he's three years old to run up in between his dad's legs and stand there and hang on to those pillars of his legs and peek out at the world. He knows he's so safe when he's doing that. And what is it? Ladies, I'll confess for us men. Normally you would think a woman feels really good and secure when the man puts his arm around her and gives her a gentle squeeze and lets her know it's okay. Anybody get near you, I'm going to knock him out. Well, let me tell you, when you allow us to do that or when you come up and you say, honey, just, give me a, just squeeze me right now. You know what? A man knows. You know what? I'm owned. It's human nature. Our ridiculous culture has thought, well, that's somehow weak. Let me tell you, every one of us want to be loved. And we want to be loved securely, without condition. Don't tell me. Don't even talk to me if you disagree with me on this. You're going to be wrong. You want to be loved. And then God comes along and says, listen, I'd love to give you a hug, and I've been kind of doing that all your life. Remember when you had this happen and you really even didn't know me but I said this to you and I encouraged you or I showed you this or that or or I explained that to you and you didn't know where that came from or I got you out of that thing remember that you didn't even know it was me giving you a hug but he said giving you a hug's not enough God says I want to be in your house your body I want to dwell and if that's true church there is going to be such a dramatic, radical boldness and beauty about us as believers. I'm not talking about being obnoxious. I'm not talking about being loud. I'm talking about just walking in confidence and knowing my God loves me and I've read my Bible, that love letter to me, and he says no weapon formed against me is going to prosper. And the Bible says, you know what? God says, I own you. I bought you with the price of my own blood and that is an announcement. I don't need to let anyone abuse me. Young lady, listen, if somebody's trying to put it on you, you tell them, back off, I belong to God. Put yourself away and get out of my face. If God loves me, then I respect myself. Get out of here. You belong to God. Stand up, be strong, be firm, because your God loves you. He's amazing, and he desires this house for himself. Every building exists for a purpose, at least it should. The next thing I want you to see is that he's a protector of his house. Look at verse 17. He says, if anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. And I need to define what that means. First of all, the temple of God. Listen. The temple in the Old Testament was a meeting place It had elements of it. The tabernacle in the wilderness after leaving Egypt was before the temple. The tabernacle preceded the temple. It was a meeting place. Ladies and gentlemen, listen. The Bible says in the Old Testament and in the New that what was of the old regarding the priesthood, the kings, The offerings, the blood, the Ark of the Covenant, all of that stuff was just a foreshadow of that which was to come. It was to accommodate our weakness. What do you mean? I need, I I, I hope this comes across right. Um, if, okay, do you remember, do you, were you here a couple Sundays ago when I was here <laughs> last? <laughs> um, because that was Pulpit Freedom Sunday and because there was an intentional drama to it, what did I do that I've never done before nor did I ever think I would ever do? Because of the Black Robe Regiment of the revolutionary period who preached the sermons that brought about the revolution of the United States of America and our founding, I put on a black robe for illustration. And no one said, you're not going to do that again, are you? You trust me enough to not ever do that again. But you know what? There's some people who, that's how they were brought up, where the pastor wears the robe. 
Oh, pastor, that reminded me so much of the other church I used to go to. That's kind of cool. Are you going to do that again? No. <laughs> so I'm not knocking robes. Here's the thing. If there are external things in our lives, this is what God is saying, even if it's a temple, even if you think, listen, that you're in danger out there, but the moment you cross the threshold of the property or come into the building, now, now I'm safe. Why? I'm in the church. Then you've missed it. Oh, we can't talk to God unless we go to the... No, listen. Even in the Old Testament, I can't talk to God unless... What? Do you remember David, whose troops, they were walking through the fields and they began to take the wheat on the Sabbath and they began to eat? And God was fine with it. It was the priest who ran out there and got all bent out of shape. And the same thing happened with Jesus and his disciples. And Jesus, it's awesome. Remember what he said? He, it still freaks people out today. He says, the man wasn't made for the law, for the Sabbath. <gasps> all the legalistic people go, <gasps> no, Jesus says, no, man was not created for the law and for the Sabbath. The law and the Sabbath, that was created for man. It was to bless him. It was to speak to him. It was to point him to God. And so when you walk into a building and it's all ornate or whatever, you guys, I have been, I have been to the Kremlin. I've been to Buckingham Palace. I've, been to, I've walked through the White House. I have been, um, I think I've been, I've been there. I mean, you name it, I think I've seen the, I've seen the crown jewels. Uh, I, um, I've been to the blue room, the green room. I, okay, what? I've been there. You don't walk in there and go, oh my goodness, I, I think I'm the queen of England. <laughs> you don't think that. You don't walk into the White House and say, oh my gosh, I think I'm the president. <laughs> You're crazy if you think that. <laughs> you, that's not... You don't walk into a church no matter how ornate. I, again, I've been in the Vatican. You don't walk into the Vatican and say, oh my gosh, I think I'm the Pope. I think I'm the Pope. You don't do that. Why? When you see things and you get so impressed with the monuments, the icons, the statues, the building, the thing... It is the religiosity of man embracing things that are temporal and they'll crumble away. And God says, get it out of the way, move it, clear it out, because I'm coming in. i got to end with this because we're out of time. Do you remember when Solomon's temple was built? And it was really, it's really cute. You got to read Chronicles and it's super, man. It's great. They're all getting ready. They got the priesthood ready. They got all their gowns on. They're all ready to go. They got all the stuff. They got all the silver where the silver's supposed to be. They got all the gold where the gold's supposed to be. Priests have got their little turban bonnet things on. They're all ready to go. No doubt, you know, there's, oh, and a big deal, and it's a big deal. You know, that there's, there's got to be coordinators. They're all checking. Are you right? Okay, they're, you know, like, getting ready move that stand up straight okay and they're all doing they're all getting ready and they're getting ready to dedicate the temple to god guess what happens you know what happens right totally outside proto nobody had this on their clipboard <laughs> the holy spirit descended and filled the temple and light came out of the temple so brilliant and so bright before anybody got in it that when the priest tried to go in, are you listening? We're done. Are you with me? Watch this. When the priest tried to go into the temple, the power of God wouldn't let him in. Can you imagine? Oh, man. What in the world? Try it again. Go. We got to get this show on the road. Come on. The sundial says 12 noon. Let's do it. And they go in and go in. The glory of God, it says, had filled the temple and nobody could enter in. If the glory of God fills your temple, nobody, nothing of this world can get in there. 
So we do this stuff. We, we're looking at this. We're looking at that. And we're, what are we doing? We're in this massive clash. You have been bought with a price. You're brand new. You're a new creation of Christ. So why do we gravitate back to the things of the world? Well, everybody's doing it. That's not the answer. And that's why now, if you go, if you try to do something that you ought not to be doing, and the Holy Spirit says, I don't want this to happen, and you try to do it, think of that. The light of the Spirit's pushing it back. It's pushing it back. And God help the man or woman who can get into the darkness of this world, and there's no resistance. The Holy Spirit doesn't live there. If you can leave this place today and sin up a storm with no conscience about it, it's because the Holy Spirit does not know you. He's not in you. He doesn't have you. And I don't know about you, but that should make you sick to your stomach and terrify you. Because just like in this life, you want to be owned by someone who loves you then why not allow yourself to be owned by the one who ultimately gives life?